All right. Hello and good morning, Gold Nation. Welcome back to another episode of MEC Wednesdays, W-I-N-S. These sessions are designed to help you win. And, you know, I've got this feeling in my body that today is going to be an extraordinarily epic day. We've got an outstanding, illustrious guest joining us today to talk about the road to the top to help us win in the marketplace and go out there and compete We've bought, brought in a very special guest all the way from Utah. But before we go there, welcome to the show, Stephanie Flood. How are you this morning? I am great. I'm very excited to get to talk to our guest today and hear the amazing things that he has done to excel in his business. That's right. That's right. Well, without further ado, we're going to jump right in. We've got Ryan Kramer, the number one agent for all of Utah, joining us on this special edition of MEC Wednesday. Ryan, how you feeling this morning, man? Good to have you. I'm doing I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. I need to hire you as my personal hype man. Let's that's, go. That's I'm, what I'm ready to, to go. And, <laughs> and you've got the uh, I mean, you're on the third floor. You've got this epic view from uh, from your office there. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to let you kind of do some talking here in just a minute. But uh, this is this is a special episode team. Ryan has been in the business for uh, just over 20 years. He's the number one agent in Utah part of Remax Associates, which, by the way, is the newest addition to Gold Nation. So now Gold Nation expanding into six states. Uh, we've got Remax Associates and the number one agent for all of you, Tommy. What more can you ask for on a special edition of MEC Wednesday? Uh, so, Stephanie, why don't you kind of tee up today's conversation with Ryan, and then we'll pass it over to him to get started. Absolutely. So, Ryan, I have 258 closed sites in 2021. And I know I'm, I'm going to give like the two second bio because I want you to tell us more than, than what I'm going to say from Southern California originally. So our, our Remax One folks definitely have, have a lot in common. And, and I believe I see L.A. over your shoulder there as well. That's but right. Been in the business since you were 18. Just thrilled to have you here today to share your perspective and your success. Uh, know you started in the industry young, which is relatable from us here as co-hosts being in the industry young. But can you kind of share with our audience? how you got started. And as a young agent without the experience, how did you start to build your business? And what did you do in those early years to gain the trust of consumers? Great question. So, and I think the first thing to take into consideration is 20 years ago, technology has changed dramatically, of course, right? So, you know, what techniques and methods we used are slightly different than they are today. There were no text messages there, you know, emails were not common. I mean, we still had dial up internet and fax machines and the, the MLS was just switching to an actual online platform from, you know, printing pages and picking them up every week from the board of realtors. So the good news though, is, is no matter, matter how long you've been in the business or how new you are to the business at the end of the day, the good old school, old fashioned things still work. And so what I would highly recommend to any of these new agents um, is getting back to more of the basics that a lot of us veteran agents used to use. And that would be getting face to face and getting voice to voice. And if you're new, that is really, really key because you have to separate yourself somehow until you get a track record or a resume built up to impress clients. So more so than worrying about text messages and phone calls and emails. If there's a good expired, a good physical, get there in person, build that relationship with them as quickly as you can. And that's honestly how I had to do it. And I think it's important for these agents to understand as well. I, I used to have to keep a bottle of Pepto-Bismol in the office. I mean, I would get just the worst stomach aches and make myself sick and nauseated knowing I had to go knock on these doors. I mean, I would drop off you know, an expired letter, knock on the door and sprint back to my car and take off because I was petrified. And so I know it's tough to get past that cold calling and or door knocking face to face. But believe me, it's so much easier face to face. So for me, I basically walked a neighborhood uh, walking distance from my office and uh, sold one in there. Um, I had to take it at a, at a $500 flat fee, which the way I was looking at that was, hey, that's a lot more than I'm making at the country club armor all and golf carts, so I'll do it. Turns out that seller ended up being the associate broker's daughter in my office, and uh, so I got a little bit of backlash for that, but ended up selling 14 of them in there over the next year or so. And so that really kind of jump-started it because they went to church and told everybody about me, and, and I kept canvassing the area reluctantly. And again, when I say reluctantly, I mean I was 
still reaching out to them, still sending them letters, knocking on doors, but making myself nauseated pretty much every single day. I, I heard something in there, this FISBOs and expireds, and it sounds very familiar kind of to Anthony, to your start with the, the Mike Ferry script. Are you a Mike Ferry guy from, from back then as well, Ryan? Yeah, so I, I was fortunate. Uh, I happened to go to the same gym as at the time who was the uh, top dog in Utah, ironically also a REMAX agent. He's since retired. And um, he had mentioned Mike Ferry to me. And so when I was getting into the business, he said to get on the phone with him. So two things I did do differently than a lot of young agents is, number one, I had an assistant within six months of being in the business. And number two, I uh, got with coaching right away. And that comes from more of my my athletic background in that, gosh, if I'm starting to learn how to ski, I'm hiring an instructor or a coach. If I want to learn how to do this, I'm instantly hiring because I want to accelerate that learning curve as quickly as possible. And I understand it, you know, there are a lot of costs and fees involved in that. But if you're committed to the business, you know, find a way to make it happen and make it happen because it will tremendously accelerate um, you getting to your potential or help you determine that this business isn't for you and get out. And that's fine too. Yep. Ryan, I want to kind of go back to something you said a moment ago where you said you were relentless in your pursuit of canvassing the neighborhood, knocking on those doors, engaging those conversations, dropping off the letters, doing all of the things in that farm. Can you give us some numbers? I mean, how often were you out there? How many hours were you out there? How many doors would you estimate that you would knock on? I mean, what's the What's the analytics behind that relentless approach? Just kind of curious if you can share with the audience today. Absolutely. So once I, I got one listing in there, it, it gave me a little bit of confidence, right? It just gave me a little bit of a glimmer of hope, if you will, that, oh my gosh, this, this might actually work. Holy cow. The old guys in the office weren't lying to me. I thought they were just <laughs> sending me out to haze me, you know, as, as the underclassmen, you know, and, and sit from the office windows and watch me sweat my butt off because in the summertime, it's 120 degrees here and I'm in a shirt and tie. So once I got that first listing, um, I couldn't give you the exact numbers because at that time I wasn't tracking them, but I would say that I was knocking at least one full street in that community every single day. And I would just keep it on rotation, basically. And um, again, I, I knew that wasn't the best way to do it. But I also knew from, from going back to sports and everything else, the more you do something, the better you're going to get at it. And the more, uh, you know, fly a kite, Ryan, and the more door slammed in my face, the closer I was to potentially one. I just had to trust that process that it would work just like you know, learning how to uh, ice skate for hockey when I was really young. I was like, all right, you know, it sucked, it sucked, it sucked. And then all of a sudden, one day, it just clicked. And I was like, wow, you know, I can do this and I can do that. And and so I just, I guess I was, you can say, stupid enough and, and simple-minded enough to say, okay, if I just outwork everybody, everything is going to work out okay. And so continuing that uh, persistent uh, approach obviously did pay off for me. And then, and then again, it it gave me a little bit of confidence, which just made me dangerous enough to kind of go to that next level um, and get the assistant in place and and create some better systems and, and get back out there. And again, it's a lot easier to say, hey, we just sold one or I just sold one or blah, 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 when you're meeting with somebody. Because again, when you're starting off young in the business, especially at our age at 18, people look at you and they're like, do you even own a home? Have you ever owned a home? And you think I'm going to trust you to sell my home? So there was definitely a disadvantage there. And then coming to a very small conservative town uh, that was like 93% uh, Mormon or Latter-day Saints, you know, and here, here's a young kid that wasn't of the predominant ideology. Obviously, you know, it, it, it didn't make it easier, but I did find, and I think an important thing to note as well for all agents, when you're going into an area, if you work hard and you work with integrity and honesty, you're going to succeed, yeah. you know, that people will work with other people, cultures, races, religions, anything else, sexual orientations, whatever you want to call it, as long as they can feel like you're going to be honest and, and operate with integrity and treat them the way you want to be treated. Yeah. I want to drill down just a little bit. You said something that, that I actually wrote down. You said, trust the process, right? Trust the process. And I think that's such an important point to make and really highlight here on our conversation, because so often we know what we need to do. And I see this time and time again, right? Like, and I'll, and I'll take open houses and it, as an example. An agent gets excited, I'm gonna do an open house and they'll do one or two or maybe five. 
And maybe nobody shows up, right, to any of those. And then we just kind of throw in the towel sometimes if the process doesn't work with a quick result. And so right. I'm reminded of an agent um, that was or that uh, still is in our organization that loves open houses. And the example I give is, hey, like if you did four open houses a week times four weeks, right, that's like 16 open houses. You're talking about well over 100 open houses for the entire year. I mean, just by sheer volume of activity and the persistence and consistency, you're going to get business if you do 100 open houses in 2023. Now, that might seem like a heavy lift, but again, going back to what you said, trust the process. You might get skunked five times in a row, but it might be that sex, uh, sex <laughs> that sixth time that actually the opportunity comes knocking or walking through the door that could turn into a whole domino effect of opportunity for the agent. And uh, th something else that you said is the more you do something, the better you get. And I often tell agents, if you did 100 open houses, do you think you might become the master at doing open houses with your conversation, your script, your welcome, your approach, how you lay out the house, how you tour them through the property, all of those things, you can really drill deep in that one strategy. So, Absolutely. And, and trust the process is, is a phrase I've used long before. I, I know it's gotten really popular on ESPN in the last couple of years, but you know that's that's something that came to me again long long time ago in just okay if you're out of shape getting on the treadmill it's going to take time and and just like trying to get into shape it takes time mentally physically spiritually it takes time to get there and so you do have to make sure you trust that process and i'm not a patient person so it's always tough to tell somebody to be patient or me to be patient you know you're going to have to be patient waiting for the results, but at the same time, be impatient about the work ethic and, and continuing to make sure, no, if I can get in another 10 phone calls, I'm going to get in another 10 phone calls. If I can get in, you know, uh, one more price reduction today, I'm going to get in one more price reduction. So. I, and I love that. And I think that flows in really well too. I want to kind of talk about, I know you have a very set schedule of how mm -hmm. you, what you accomplish in the course of a day and how you stood in your calls and everything else. Can you share with the audience that schedule and how that's really contributed to your long-term success? Uh, the schedule I, I feel is, is really the most important tool that I have and that I use, to be honest with you, because without the schedule, it's very difficult to replicate results and or determine where I can improve or where um, I'm doing really well in. And so my schedule is a little unique. Um, I, I find that the average agent or individual uh, leaves a lot of things off of their schedule. So let's say if you're setting up a schedule, we want to start on Sunday night, right? And, and I know a lot of us work on Sundays, but still Sunday night around five or six o'clock um, this time of the year, because the snow has been so good in, in Salt Lake, I'm usually not back behind my computer until about seven, seven thirty. And that's when I start setting up my schedule for the week and my goals for that individual week and what I need to do and, and look at what did I do last week or more importantly, what did I not do last week that I fall behind on my average listings that I need to take and everything else and make sure it's amped up for the upcoming week so that I can offset that deficiency. So I think, for example, the last time I did a call with Remax Gold, uh, my listing count was way down. Mm -hmm. uh, for that month, you know, January I had 32 listings and I was way down. And then all of a sudden, you know, by just getting no, 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 I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And then had nine listed um, that week after that phone call and got back on track. Right now I'm behind again. Today's the eighth. I've only gotten two listings. Looks like I had one just come in while we're sitting on this phone call and hopefully another one today, but I need to get back on track. So start the schedule from Sunday night. Okay. The most important thing in your schedule, honestly, sounds stupid, but it's sleep. You need to sleep and you need to schedule your sleep because if you don't have a consistent level of energy every single day, you're not going to produce consistent results, right? It's, it's no different. As parents, we tell our kids, you know, tournaments, stay out of the pool, lights are off. You know, when my son competes with the Olympic Development Program, lights off 10 o'clock, right? As a team dad, I got to go pull the phones out of the rooms and collect all cell phones, <laughs> right? And then make sure they're not sneaking out at night. So, and we do that because we want them to have the energy they need necessary to compete at the level that we need them to compete at or that they should be competing at. So when you start with your schedule, schedule sleep, really, 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 really important. Cause I see a lot of these agents that put together these schedules and I'm like, that's great. How many rock stars are you going to drink? <laughs> Keep up with that schedule. Cause I'm in fairly good shape and I've been doing this a long time, which helps get you in shape. Cause you have to be in shape for prospecting, right? More mentally than physically, of course. But 
that sleep is key. So definitely schedule in your sleep first. So my, my day starts at 4.30 a.m., usually hits news twice or um, actually my son just taught me that I can tell Siri to, uh, to, you know, hit snooze for me. So I actually don't have to reach over and do it myself. So I'm out of bed usually at about 448. I find it does change a little bit from winter to summer because our days here, um, in the summertime, the sun stays up to about 930, 940 in July. And so, um, it does change slightly. I'm getting my exercise done all my, you know, what I need, my antidepressant, uh, which is like my exercise, the good endorphins, which is like, you know, an extra cup of coffee every morning. And then I'm in my office by 7 a.m. every single morning. Now from, from about 7 to 7.30, I'm getting all the new expires and cancels ready to go for myself. Um, and then 7.30, I'll look to see if there were any urgent emails that came in over the night that I need to get responded to. If not, they get forwarded to my, my staffer, Tiffany, who is so much more than a staffer, as we've discussed in the past. I mean, she is she's everything that makes what I do possible. And so at 7.55, I've, you know, I've got earplugs in, phone's ready to go. And, and then it's literally, I mentally still, as corny as it is, literally hear a buzzer go off in my head. And boom, that's that's the game horn. It's game time now. So from 8 to 11, it's game time. There is no messing around. My son knows not to call me unless there's an emergency at school. He knows unless it's an emergency, I'm not going to answer the phone call. My girlfriend's not calling or bugging me between those times unless it's an emergency. Um, because those are the most profitable hours of my day for me personally. And I find for most people, they are. So <clears throat> 8 to 11, no interruptions. Now, my schedule is pretty fine-tuned. So at 7.48 every day, that's when I go use the restroom before I come back behind my desk to get ready for prospecting because I've already had about two cups of coffee on average, right? My two big Yeti. So it's about 60 ounces of coffee by, by 7.48. <laughs> and then uh, I usually try to get a protein bar down. Uh, one of my Costco protein bars usually goes down around 11.45. Um, and then 12 o'clock, um, I start looking at what results did I get or not get from that prospecting, double check to see if there were any really, really good leads in that that I need to go back and follow up with. Um, and then after that, depending on the day, uh, there are certain days in my schedule where I have price reduction scheduled, of course. And then Wednesdays and Thursdays, I've got scheduled in in the afternoons to follow up with every one of my sellers personally, both the husband and wife or life partners or spouses. But I always like to talk with both of them so that I don't have one that I'm losing for lack of communication or feeling like one was left out. That's something I know a lot of agents struggle with as well. And it's not fun, but it's just, you know, the necessary evil that you have to talk with both sellers. Um, and then from one to four is when I set up my appointments. Um, the majority of the day. So for new agents, follow the schedule religiously. There are no deviations. There are no exceptions whatsoever. Until you start getting to about 50, 75 transactions, you haven't proven that you have the discipline to deviate from that schedule. So you don't get to deviate from the schedule. Stick with the schedule. Long term, it's going to pay off and, and provide better results. Once you start doing 50 or 75 transactions a year or more consistently, then like I said, you've kind of paid in the kitty. You have the right. If you got a hot listing presentation or something you need to get done, go ahead and get it done and so forth. Closings, I also try to always schedule in the afternoons between two and four o'clock if at all possible. Um, fortunately, in my region, most of my closings are out of area. A lot of second homes, people already moving out of area. And so um, I'd say only 10% of the time am I actually in person at the closing. Um, of course, I always make sure we follow up with them before they get there, you know, let them know we've looked at all the numbers, they look good, blah, blah, blah. And then from six to seven, I like to make sure, um, and again, this depends on the time of year, winter is different than summer here, um, but I would say on average at six to seven, I'm back on the phones, just following up with everybody. If I can't catch them in the mornings, maybe I can catch them in the evenings. Mm -hmm. You know, prime example, last night, um, took a car in to get an oil change and ended up deciding uh, or being talked into buying a new one. So I ended up buying a new one and that was in Las Vegas. And so that's what an hour and, you know, 40, 45 minutes from, from St. George. And so drove down there uh, after my five o'clock appointment. And um, on the way home, I was back on the phone in the car, just, you know, following up with the people that I didn't get a hold of. There's no point in wasting an hour and 45 minutes. There's no music or podcast um, or ESPN radio that's more important to me than potentially getting another listing in that time period. And, and you will find in your schedule the 
the more you have it down to the minute, the more hours you're going to find that you've completely wasted, whether it's five minutes at the coffee pot or, you know, I, I've noticed a lot of our agents in the, in, in the office go into the bathroom and they must be on Instagram or something because they're just like sitting there scrolling or something. I have no idea, but there's 30 minutes in somebody's day. You know, if you end up picking up your kid at school and there's a long wait in line to pick up your kid at school, have your contacts with you. Make some calls. Even if you're just calling a seller to say, hey, just wanted to let you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that we don't have an update yet this week. We've had bad weather or this, that, the other. But I wanted to let you know we're still working on getting your home sold. So we just need to make sure we're not wasting that time. If you think about your nine to five, eight to five, whatever it is that you're working, that's your game time. That's your 60 minutes that you get if you were an athlete. So you can't put your skates on if you're a hockey player when they drop the puck. You've got to have those on warmed up and ready to go because when the puck gets dropped, it's time to play, right? I mean, you don't watch the pitchers come out of the bullpen. I mean, I know sometimes it feels that way with Dave Rogers as our manager, but oh my gosh, it's like uh, those guys are warmed up before they get to the, to the mound, right? And there's a reason for that. You have to perform best in those allotted time frames and hours that we are given. And I find a lot of agents reached out after the other phone call. And they're like, well, this is when I, I, I get on the phones texting the expires and cancels. And I asked them, well, why don't you do it earlier? Well, because I have this, this, and this. Well, the buying public and the selling public doesn't care about your schedule. So if you want those listings and or buyers, then you need to call when you can, when it's best opportunity to capture those leads. And there's no shelf life on leads, as we know, right? So it's just like, well, an expired listing is only good for an hour in my market. You're probably more competitive. It may be even be less than that. Now, the highly skilled agents can obviously um, make up for some of that time lag with the scripts and their resumes and so forth. But why make it harder on yourself? You know, if you're LeBron James, you don't want to give the other team a 10-point lead and then see if you can make a comeback. No, just put your foot in their throat from the get-go and, and, and remove all hope that anybody else is, is going to beat you. So again, schedule is, is definitely the most important thing at any level. I, I have to have agents that do more business than me come down on me for my schedule and say, no, you're doing too many pot, you know, this, that, or the other, you're doing this, or you're doing that, drop it. You know, and, and there's a reason why I eat lunch in my car or behind my desk every single day as I'm doing things. And that's a sacrifice to me. That's little, it's like, would I rather have an extra deal? Or would I rather go to a steakhouse and get a nice filet and lobster tail? And I love filet and lobster tail, but I'd rather have the other deal because then I can get the lobster tail delivered to my house whenever I want, when I get home, yeah. right? So schedule, super, super important. That can't be understated, and that's probably more important. You know, a lot of people will spend time tweaking their, their scripts. Start with the schedule because the scripts aren't going to be utilized as well as they should be without that schedule. So 64 ounces of coffee. That's the key. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I thought I drank a lot of coffee, man, but 64. You By, got 9 By 9 o'clock. By 9 o'clock. All right, good. Excellent. Uh, I want to go to your listing presentation. Uh, and, and if you would, just take a minute to kind of, you know, compare the listing presentation and the approach from early in your career, right? Mm -hmm. Like in your 20s to now how that listing presentation has evolved, what the conversation looks like. And is there a difference? Uh, there, there definitely is a difference. Obviously, you know, when you're starting in your career, it's it's more focused on <clears throat> being able to provide them with reassurances that no one else is ever going to outwork you to get their home sold or to find them their dream home, whatever that may be, right? You, you have to take more of uh, the standpoint of what you're going to be doing for them and that you're going to be their top priority to we still want to make them feel that way, of course, as you build up a resume and, and, and a track record, but then you can take it more into a combination of, you know, when people ask, well, why should I hire you versus this other agent? And, you know, I'll let them know. Well, because the one promise I can give you, Mr. And Mrs. Sellers, that no one's going to outwork me to get your home sold. Yeah. And that is proven by, you know, let's go in and look at the listing presentation. And this is one that I'm doing right after this phone call. And we just open it up and just say, okay, well, here are the sales stats. Let's see. Last year sold, you know, X amount of homes. And then I show them out of those number of homes, X amount were listings, and then just go from there. And then my average days on market versus the county averages, and just show them all that. And, and so I think the main thing is to make sure it's a non-ego based, right? You, you don't want to have all your 
what I call the hero wall where you walk into these agents' office and it's like trophy after trophy after trophy after trophy. Mm-hmm. And and they're usually pretty sad trophies. It's like million dollar club. I'm like, is that gross commission income or you sold a million dollars in property? Because that's not very impressive, right? So we want to make it about them and we want to make it about accomplishing their goals as best as possible. Um, and think of when you're putting together your listing presentations, because mine basically is the Mike Ferry presentation more or less, that we want to put ourselves in their shoes. What would you want to hear if you were them? What would make you feel good about working with yourself? And in many cases, you get the analyticals and the drivers that want to see the stats and numbers, and boom, they sign the listing agreement with 15 minutes. Unfortunately, we had the amiables and some of the other personality types that it's more about how you make them feel, not what you can show them or tell them. And those are the ones I struggle with a little bit more. And so those are the ones that I really have to slow down and take extra time and, and work through that process with them. So the listing presentation has definitely evolved um, and it continues to evolve as technology gets better. Uh, it continues to improve. I mean, I have that same thing basically in a slideshow that I can email people as well so that they can take a look at it. And then I like I have a 3.30 um, listing presentation and they're in Florida right now and it, it expired the other day and I got a hold of them. And so we've set up a Zoom conference and I'm gonna take them through the slideshow of that presentation while I've got them on the phone just to make sure that we don't miss anything. Um, And then obviously on the comparable market analysis, that's where it's really important to go through it line item by line item with them. And then obviously net sheets are always important. The filled out contract is always important as well. But once you know what their goals are, then you can kind of go to certain aspects or points of your listing presentation and and really help uh, win them over depending on the personality type. So I, I've heard little little bits and pieces about your team and about your assistant. And I want you to share with our audience how you have your team structured and then and tell us about your your amazing assistant that has worked with you for, for a really long time, right? Yeah, it's uh we're 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 going on 15 years and as I joked last time, obviously uh the longest relationship I've had with a woman. <laughs> um she's fantastic. I mean she she really is the backbone of the operation. She really is the commander in chief of the office as well. And, and she is to the point where she can pretty much read my mind or read what I'm writing down, even though my, my penmanship is horrible. Um, and that's key. I mean, and without her, I mean, basically she is my pit crew, right? So I'm out there doing what I'm doing 200 miles an hour, but the wheels need to be replaced. The oil needs to be changed. The gas needs to be refilled. And that's what she's doing for me every single day. And she does do the work just like I do the prospecting maybe of four agents. She does the work uh, and admin and signs and pictures of of four staffers as well. Now, she's paid accordingly, of course. Um, And I think that one area that agents fail so tremendously is they want something for nothing, right? It's just like our sellers want the same thing. They don't want to pay the commissions. Uh, They want us to do it all for free, and they don't want us to pay Remax or our brokerage for the platforms that we can offer and things like that. Anyway, long story short... If you got a good assistant, Pam, you'd be an absolute fool, and I'm sorry for being harsh, but you'd be an absolute fool to underpay them and lose one. And then the amount of time it takes you to retrain one, it's costing you more than you're saving if you're doing over 50 deals a year. So stop doing that. Plus, a byproduct of having her and her great personality is my clients have fallen in love with her too. And I'll be first to admit, I've got a lot of clients that come back and work with me, not because of me. I mean, they love my stats and numbers and drive, but they think I'm an asshole. They love working with her, right? She'll walk in my office at least once every two weeks and say, hey, so-and-so called, wants us to list the property. They want to talk to you for five minutes, but they want me to go out and get it signed. Okay, that's fine. So having a a team in place um, is really, really important. Now, I just have her, uh, but obviously when I say team, you know, I've got you know, my photographers, sign companies, you know, all of that, that creates that team. Basically, the essential services that we provide is AIG, and you need that, right? Your top athletes are going to have nutritionists, sports psychologists, um, flexibility uh, trainers, um, strength trainers, right? All of those things come come into play, and if you really want to operate at your highest level, you need them operating at their highest level as well. So just to just to recap, your team is you as the agent, your assistant, and then obviously photographers and other people like that. Are there any other agents on the team producing? No. 
So 258 transactions in 2021 with essentially one agent. That's you, plus the assistant right. folks. Now, now 224 of those, 224 of those were listings. And then out of the 212 last year, 179 were listings. Wow. That's phenomenal. It's really, I mean, that's, that's seems to be very rare and unique in nature, right? I, I oftentimes hear an agent that will talk about hundreds of transactions. Oftentimes there's a team behind that. There's nothing wrong with that, where there's multiple agents selling and contributing to that production. So to hear that a single agent, essentially you plus an assistant, and of course, a few others that help with operations and things like that to go out and do over 200 transactions. But the key, as you've highlighted, is the listings. That's what gives you the leverage, right? You can go out, list a property, and boom, go to the next one, and away you go. Absolutely. So, you know, if you want to last, you got to list, right? I mean, that, that's what they talk about, obviously. And that's where you control your market share. That's where you generate the majority of your good buyer leads. Plus, then you don't have to worry about trying to buy buyer leads and things like that. So definitely, you know, listings is, is where... I feel like it's at. And when I look at most of my top colleagues that outproduce me, because those are the ones that I want to hang around and, and get their feedback, they're all listing heavy as well. Unless they have massive teams that are, you know, buying agent type teams and so yeah. forth. The, the good ones I know are all listing heavy. That's, it, it's amazing. The numbers are mind boggling when you start talking about the, the transaction count, but then you hear what you're doing to get to those numbers and it kind of helps to make sense. So uh, in the, the interesting market we're in, let's say, let's talk about what advice you might give an agent who's an experienced agent who's maybe struggling a little bit and maybe is letting the market get in their head a little bit because we hear all the things, right? All the negativity out there in the media and the press constantly about our industry. So what advice would you give to agents about the market and about the time that we're in and what they should be doing? Uh, number one, just suck it up, buttercup. I mean, <laughs> Yeah. The first thing when, when I have agents come to me and complaining that are experienced, I say, let me see your gross commission income statement. And I look at it. So, well, you're not acting like a three hundred or $400,000 producer. You're acting like a whiny little teenager. And that's the reality of the situation. And again, I have to have people have these conversations with me. And that's why, you know, the team I have in place can look at my numbers and can give it to me just like I would give it to anybody else. Because Sitting here and focusing on the positives that I did 212 sales last year isn't going to get me any better. You know, let, let me show you real quickly. This right here is a stack of listings I did not get. Mm -hmm. So I look at this and say, there's seven figures in commissions in this stack that I somehow missed out on that I needed to prove on. So this is what I'm focusing on because it's telling me, okay, what did I leave on the table potentially? Right. And if I'm at office 10 hours a day, nine hours a day, no reason why I shouldn't be snagging at least two or three more of these a month. Right. So, you know, what can the experienced agent do? Again, number one, you just got to change the mental mindset. Yeah. Right. If you guys are golfers and you get to the golf course and the wind starts blowing on the back nine, you're going to leave? No. <laughs> the better, more experienced golfers, are gonna do better in those elements because it takes a better set of skills to play well in inclement weather. Now, will par in essence maybe go up on a golf course in bad weather? Yes, but it's relative to the field. So again, you just have to change your mindset and say, okay, the market doesn't determine what I'm going to make. It just determines what I have to do to make what I want. And of course, there's gonna be realistic expectations that it's like, okay, I can't physically, if prices are dropping to this point, I can't hit some of these numbers, especially when I've got six or 7% market share. It's just not going to happen. So I'm not going to have that extra disposable income that I have or have had. And that's fine. Um, so number one would probably be mindset. Number two is just going to be stop taking the path of least resistance. We all do this. I do it myself. Oh, I'm going to text message this client to do the price reduction because this is what the feedback is for the 10th time in a row after telling me in the presentation that this was too high, right? No, that's the path of least resistance. Get them on the phone, on a conference call, husband and wife, and talk through it, take the 15 minutes, and get it done the right way. And they're more likely to work with you again 
if you take the path of least resistance, even if you're giving them bad information, right? So that would probably be the second thing that I would focus on is all of the things we don't want to do are going to be the most profitable, right? The prospecting, the price reductions, all of that stuff that most of us look at is not fun. The better you get at it, the more fun it's going to be. I don't know anybody that is good at something and they hate it. I mean, if you're good at something, it just it just makes it hard not to enjoy it. So definitely um, focus on that. And then I would also work on refining the schedule probably third. Um, if not, maybe second. It just kind of depends on that individual agent. But again, let's look at the schedule. Where are we deficient? What are we not doing? Why prospect three hours a day? How many contacts did you make? Oh, well, oh, you don't even know? Well, that's a problem. I mean, I can tell you right now from this morning, you know, old archaic, but it's the same thing. I've got all my hashes. I know how many I've had. I only got to 25 because we got on the call at 1030, and that would have me right in line with 30 in three hours and one presentation set, right? And I can tell you, oh, what did I do yesterday, right? And then I can go back and tell you what I've done for all the other years. Wow. Tell you how many homes I listed, how many homes I sold each and every single month for years and years and years. So I know what I'm capable of, where I need to improve. And then also, if I'm behind schedule, right? And again, think of our workday a lot like a, a track athlete. My, you know, if, if you run the mile and you run a five minute mile, you know you have to run a lap every 75 seconds. And one of the issues that I find is that if you run a 65 second lap, let's say, okay, you automatically feel like you earn some time off next week or on the next lap. Well, you finally got some momentum going. Now's actually the time to put the pedal to the metal and see if you can get to 62, right? As athletes, we tend to say, if I've scored my PR in the first quarter of a game, I'm not asking the coach to sit out second, third, fourth quarter. I hit my PR. No, we're going to see if we can break a record. And again, that's just the mindset that we have to have. And so we'll go back to looking at that example I gave of the triathlon starts. When you jump in the water at a triathlon, it's a mess. I mean, you got, it's like fish out of water. There's elbows, there's knees. People are coming out bloody. People are getting knocked out. Well, you can stay in that pack, which in our market, well, your market again is, is, is different because of the average price ranges and so forth. But let's say that's probably that 150 to 350 income range, right? It's a mess. You don't have the great resume to really set yourself apart. I mean, you're just making it so much harder on yourself every single day. It's like leaving the office every day at the same time and hitting rush hour traffic. Leave earlier or leave later and then stay in the office. Right? There's a reason why I have offices on different parts of town so that I know if I'm stuck and there's traffic, I'm not going to sit in traffic. I'm going to go to the office and make calls. If it's a 15-minute drive, why make it 45? You know, So get ahead of the pack to smooth water. Or you can choose to get behind the pack, and you're going to have smooth water as well. But none of us like that, and Remax agents aren't tended known for, you know, the low income producing agents. That's just not what we usually hire or want to retain at our company. So, um, mindset: suck it up. Two, stop taking the path of least resistance. And three, really focus on that schedule and really refine it. Yeah. Really refine it. Well, I think it goes without saying you're highly disciplined. You clearly have a schedule dialed. Let's talk about some of the systems, if you would, behind that schedule and those activities. Are you using uh, any sort of power dialer system to make your prospecting contacts and calls? Are you doing it old school on your cell phone? What, are, what systems are you using today to really power the results and the disciplines that you're talking about? And this is where I'm deficient. One of my, one of my big strengths is obviously being very tunnel vision. And you, know, you, you set a goal in a course and it's the course we're taking. Good, bad, indifferent, it's full speed ahead. So yes, I've got four cell phones sitting on my desk right now. Um, I don't use a CRM. I don't use a dialer. Um, I've tried it. Not bad. You know, um, everybody's got a different style on that. Most of my top colleagues all do. So I would say that that's probably the better way to do it. You can look behind me and see those are the stacks of the contacts I've talked to today, other contacts I need to talk to. Um, you know, and then you got more stacks like these that I've been calling on right now. And it gets, you know, I talk to the contacts, make my notes, it gets scheduled and filed. When that day comes up, then I'm back on the phone with them. Um, 
it's a system that's worked for me. Uh, I know in the last conversation I talked about going back, what would I do different? Um, and other than finishing, you know, going to law school and being an attorney or something, it would have been to have better databases and better systems in place from the get-go. Because it's so easy when you start to do it. But then going back after you've done a thousand transactions and trying to add birthdays and this and that and kids' names, oh my gosh, it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. So de definitely commit to doing a better job there. And I definitely need to do a better job there. I'm definitely deficient in that area and definitely deficient in technology and YouTube. And, you know, people go to my Instagram. I don't even have a website. People go to my Instagram all the time. They're like, it's just you and your son and skiing and your girlfriend. I'm like, yeah, I don't. Instagram's for me. It's not for work. I don't I don't put any of my work stuff out there at all. I think I make one real estate post a year, and it's usually at the award ceremony thanking Tiffany, my staffer. I love that. So uh, I, I got to put in here, you're, you're an L.A. sports fan, though, right? It, it, it would Huge. appear you're an L.A. Oh, gosh darn it. All right. Well, you know, Giants fan over well, here. But, but I'm, I love the parallels that you draw between sports and business because it's so real and there are such good analogies to share and to impart that wisdom to, to everybody. I know you have um, coached in your son's teams over the years. What have you helped him and his teammates maybe learn about life that translates to how they're growing up now and, and where they're headed? Well, absolutely. And it, and it, and it's an interesting time now, right? I mean, it's totally different and, and I'm in a very conservative area. So it's maybe a little uncouth for me to say, but I'm, you know, again, I, I just, I am who I am. I say what I think positive, negative about myself, about, um, questions I'm asked. And so it's tough right now. I mean, when we grew up, it was the birds and the bees, right? And now it's the birds and the bees and the bees that like bees and the birds that like, I mean, it's just, it's just different and birds that feel like bees. And so it's really tough these days because there are so many more influences on us as agents and our kids, of course. And so, again, that's where in that schedule you can really have it narrowed down to what is important to you, what are your core values, and continue that path. So coaching for me and, and with the young boys, the number one thing I always want to co uh, teach them is to be not number one, because just like I tell my kids all the time, number one is a reflection in most cases that your competition is shit right? Not that you're any good. It's that your competition isn't any good, right? How's that worked out for our Dodgers? We've been number one for how long and then get to the playoffs? I walked out of Padre Stadium last year in the sixth inning. My girlfriend said, you want to leave? I said, yeah, I can already tell you. Dave's going to go ahead and change up the pitchers. We're going to lose this game and it's over. So let's go have a nice dinner. Sure enough, we're walking out. What happens? I think it was Machado goes on a, a hitting streak. So we want to be the best we can be. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, academically, athletically, that's the purpose that I got into coaching with the kids. And can you be number one? Yeah. But again, you might be leaving a lot on the table if you're number one, because it's a reflection of your competition. So be the best you can be, and at least you can be happy with that, no matter where that leaves you in the pack, at the top, in the middle, and maybe at the bottom, right? That It just may be what it is. So really striving to be the best you can be and providing the best in not only work, but in life and, and everything else is, is really truly what's going to help you get to that next level. And again, the old being honest with clients, you know what, you're right. After looking at, at everything here, sir, I don't think this is the best time for you to sell. And you know how many of those clients come back? The majority of them do. Or prospects at that point in time, the majority of them do. And you just got to have a good system to make sure you're following up with them appropriately. And they, they remember that. And they also refer that. Right. I, I get a lot of those referrals where, gosh, yeah, this guy was really honest. And so I get the appointment I'm going on at one thirty right after this. That's what that was. It was it was a referral from another client that, that we sold their home and she just said, hey, will you reach out to my mom and go get it sold? So. Um, there are so many similarities with with obviously sports and sales, both in work ethic, routines, training um, and nutrition and because again nutrition is a big part of, of what i do i don't eat great but i eat consistently and the consistent amount of calories every single day and pretty much the same foods as protein bars donuts fillets and coffee right i mean that that's what i eat the majority of my day and some carne asada tacos and so i know based on what i'm eating i'm going to get a certain level of energy out of that that will able that will allow me to sustain my day yep so ryan i, I gotta ask you, you know you obviously are, are measuring things. You're constantly working to get better. Like, 
at your point, you've obviously accomplished and are accomplishing at a very high level. How do you consistently, you know, measure where you're at and, and what you need to do to keep getting better? Or, or what is it that you look at for yourself personally, professionally, uh, spiritually, like all of those things that you're talking about, what are you doing now to keep pushing the pace and the envelope in your development personally? Well, the better you get at it, the easier it gets to continue to push that envelope, right? You know, I, again, going back to sports, you get to a certain level, it's easier to continue to improve in certain ways. Obviously, in other ways, it's a little bit more difficult because when you're already amazing at something, now they're more fine-tuned tweaks. And a lot of those may not actually be what you're doing on the court. It may be doing what you're doing off the court in order to perform better on the court, right? So for me, uh, I, I would say, just being flat out honest, there's still a lot of crap I want to buy I can't afford, right? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I got my eye on some buildings I would really like to buy, and I just can't seem to get the bank to give me the money for them yet, or I need more of a down payment for them. So, for me, that, that's a big motivating factor, of course, is I, I have a certain number of types of buildings and buildings I want to own myself. And, and um, until I get there, I think I'm just going to continue to keep pushing it. And, and I was very blessed. One of the big differences is I've had health, uh, fortunately, and, and that's why I do exercise every single day and have for 20 plus years. Um, and then I was naturally gifted an engine, if you will, you know, a, a work ethic. And, and that's been huge because a lot of people don't have that. And it's hard to learn it. My, my disadvantage is a lack of patience and wanting to sit there and talk through something with somebody when we're having to just validate their feelings, right? My girlfriend jokes all the time. She's like, oh my gosh, I'd be the happiest woman in the world. If you validated my feelings the way you did that seller who's overpriced, I'd marry you today, right? So <laughs> those are the things that I need to work on as well. But also as a father, and this is a close second, if not right there with number one, it's, you got to lead by example. I mean, I can sit there and tell my son to get off his phone, but if I'm on my phone, he's not getting off his phone. If I tell him to wear a seatbelt and he's yelling at me, you're not wearing your seatbelt, why do I need to wear mine, right? So when he sees, when we travel to all these tournaments, and, and I've coached everything up until this year, this was the last year I coached my last game in eighth grade football for him. I coached everything. I was a room parent, Right. I still do all I and you know I still go to all of his games and now they're not in the county they're in multiple states I mean we're, we're airplane rides away to get there so it's my production is very possible with one assistant and being able to still be a great father in my opinion because I've been at everything in fact he loves the fact that now he's getting to the age where his friends can pick him up and take him because they're old enough because he doesn't have to spend the time with me so leading him by example is also huge because he sees that work ethic. He sees that his grandpa, who's 74 years old, that sold all his um, businesses in California, still gets out every single day and, and he's getting work done and, and, and still has things that he wants to accomplish and, and work on. And so, um, you know, the best gift I can give my son, obviously, is, is a work ethic and the there's a huge enjoyment in self-accomplishment that is really underrated anymore these days. And in order to get there as a parent, you have to let your kids struggle. And again, I, I, I suffer from that as, as much as anybody else, you know, it's, it's, it's easy when you're looking at somebody else's kids to be like, Oh, he's babied and spoiled. Um, and then when it comes down to your kid, it's a little bit harder to, to put your foot down. But again, those are the things that, that, that have to happen in order to get the results that you want, whether it's with your kids or with work, with your spouse or, or anything else. I've got a couple audience questions here that I, I right. throw out to you. So we've got a question from Matt Carter in Gardnerville who was asking, are you referring buyers to agents in town? And if you do, do you have an agreement that they can't list with those agents if they go to list in a few years? So this is a really small town here. And so I, I guess you can say my relationships with the agents that I send those to, I don't have anything in writing with, and I've never been screwed uh, by the ones that I have with me now. Um, yes, obviously that would be wise to make sure that you have those agreements in writing and not only if they list one home, but do you want the commissions if they list multiple homes because they may buy multiple homes and, and sell multiple homes. So those are definitely things you would want spelled out very clearly because, as we know, if it's not in writing, number one, it doesn't exist, and number two, it just creates animosity. Um, and what you felt was what you proposed and what they felt was proposed may honestly just be a a difference of, of what was expected or re relayed. And so it's not even that they tried to be dishonest. 
they just didn't know what you were expecting. So I would definitely recommend, you know, to have it in writing. It's foolish for me not to have those in writing, to be honest with you. Thank you. I got, got one more here of asking, where did those contacts come from? Your stack of, of contacts that you have to call each day that Tiffany provides to you. How do you generate those? Well, so, and Tiffany doesn't, she files them, but she doesn't provide them to me. And I, and I, and I just to clarify on that, because the most profitable thing I do every single day is obviously my prospecting. I don't let anybody touch it or do it. And it goes with me every place I go. It just, it just does. Cause if I have free time, I'm going to get on the phones. If I'm, you know, my table's not ready for dinner. I'm going to run back out to the car and get on the phone. And so as an example, this one right here, and you probably can't see it, but this listing came off the market in 2017 on 2800 Escalon Drive. And I've been staying in touch with her since then. And now her health is finally getting poor enough, according to my notes, as of a month ago, that is probably going to have to be listed. So now I'm working on getting in contact with the kids in case something does happen to her, because they will probably be the point of contact now. So it gets filed. Now, where do they come from? This is an old, this one wasn't expired. And then let's see, that's a Zillow FISBO. That's a newspaper FISBO. That's a canceled. So mainly canceled FISBOs, expired, things like that. Um, notice the defaults, we're not seeing a lot of them, but I will be listing two short sales, it looks like, or turning one into a short sale and then listing another one. That's a short sale, so notice the defaults. Uh, we've seen agents obviously go after the obituaries. I leave that up to you. That is, I'm very aggressive, but that's not someplace that I've gone. Um, better to start establishing relationships with the trust attorneys and estate family law attorneys because they can refer those to you and that's a much easier bridge. Um, and then sphere of influence is obviously a really big one as well. I mean, just constantly checking in with them and having a system. You close on a home, call them a week later, right? Everything go good. Just want to make sure everything was wired to you. Talk them through it. How's the new house? Blah, 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 blah. Um, and then even check in with the buyer. It's so easy to get the buyer's information out. If you're the listing agent, call the buyer. Yeah. Right? Agency's over. You're not stepping on anybody's toes as far as I'm concerned at this point in time. And, and you're really not soliciting them for business at that point. You're just letting them know. My name's Ryan Kramer. I was a listing agent on the home. We're glad that you bought it. I hope you and your family enjoyed as much as my clients did. Did you have any questions about the home that we can get answered for you? Or the sprinkler systems, anything else? Do you have any questions about the school district, sports in your area that I can refer you to certain coaches, blah, blah, blah? My agent didn't do any of this, <laughs> right? And then you start and you adopt all those clients. Easy. That's right. right. Just great, great ideas. Um, I want everybody to stay because I do have a giveaway item. So don't, don't leave. I have something right at the end here that we're going to get to. Ryan, I don't even know what to say. Thank you so much for your time this morning and being willing to share and be open about your schedule and what has worked for you. It was really inspirational to hear how things work and the, the things that you're doing every single day and the power of all of those hours and what it has led to over the course of your career. Just incredible. You're very, very welcome. And it was my pleasure to be here. And and I, I do want to say one last thing, and that's just I know the way I do it isn't the best way by any means uh, whatsoever, but it is a way that has worked. Yeah. And I do consider myself to be a very low-skilled agent in terms of the scripts and everything else. And I, I mention that just because a lot of agents will immediately jump to wanting to, I need to be the best skilled. And, the you know, just like, again, with athletes, sometimes you just need dogs. Sometimes you just need guys that are diving or gals that are diving for balls. Um, you know, and, and taking charges, doing all the ugly stuff that wins games. That's what we need to do as agents, especially in a declining market where consumer confidence is lowers, is just get out there, put on a positive, happy face, right? When you flip the light switch on at the office, that's game time. And when you shut it off, you're done. Okay, so mentally you can check out. But when you're there, have the fake smile on your face, be on your feet if that helps, because it does for a lot of people, and just be positive and enthusiastic confirm the schedule, and then follow it. And then I'm excited to be on the call with, with all of your agents because I know I've got so much to learn and so many areas uh, to improve as well. And it's, you know, as long as I've been in this business, it's like, man, at least every week I learn something new that's helpful. Well, welcome to Gold Nation. It's, it's great to have you here as part of the family. Thank you, guys. Stephanie, what do you got for us? There's a giveaway. All right. I have a very lovely Gold Nation gym bag. 
appropriately enough. That seems pretty appropriate to me. So I'm going to ask you guys a question that you may not know the answer to, but I want you to learn this answer, which is why I'm asking you this is my question. Okay, so get ready with, with the chat here. What major milestone, it's a number, is Gold Nation going to hit by the middle of this year for total donations to CMN since 2015? It's a huge, oh, there we go. See, you guys already knew the answer, but I want to make sure you know that so that you can share that with your consumers. That was Clint Robertson wins Clint Robertson. with two, two million is what we're going to hit. We're going to be the first Remax ever to hit two million. And then we'll get to three and four and we're just going to keep right on going. So we have a lovely bag for you, Clint. We will get that to you. Thank you for participating. But that $2 million number, holy cow. So we're going to talk about that more as we get closer to that milestone and we will get to that donation number. But that's something I want you all to know and be very proud of because you participate in giving that money to the hospital in your community there. Perfect. I was going to thank Ryan, but he just bounced. He's like, I'm out. I got to go make calls. His, his <laughs> schedule. Like listings to take. So what an incredible uh, conversation. And just, a, again, a, a hard-hitting, honest look at ourselves and our business, the things that we're doing, and really what's possible. I mean, what we just highlighted is that a single agent, one agent, can in fact close hundreds of transactions a year with the work ethic, the discipline, the structure, the schedule, the routines. It's not all, you know, necessarily glitz and glam. It's hard work. And I think that's what Ryan just highlighted today. Of course, he's got his assistant that is also the backbone of that operation, helping make sure that things get done. But there wasn't, you know, 40 agents that were producing those 200 houses. It's one agent that's out there doing the work, getting the listings, having the conversations. So it is possible. It is possible. That's right, Stephanie, right? It's, it's hard work. There were some great nuggets in there that things that we can all apply to what we're doing every day, even if all of that obviously doesn't work for each of us. But there's definitely information there that you can apply to your business. And so this was our first opportunity to get to talk to a member of the newest Gold Nation member of REMAX Associates in Utah. And I'll tell you, this isn't the end of that, because on the Juggernaut podcast next Wednesday, you can meet the president of REMAX Associates, Ron Snow. So we are so thrilled to get to know our new Utah family here at Gold Nation and looking forward to growing together and all the fun things that we can do in the coming years. Thanks, everybody, for being here for this episode of MEC Wednesday. We will catch you on the podcast next week. Take care, everyone. We'll see you.